dear congregation, there is a richness to faith in Jesus Christ that excels all explanation. Faith in Christ is the heart of our relationship with God. Romans 5, 1 puts it this way, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, in unbelief, we are cut off. But by faith, Paul says, Romans 11, we stand. Faith is really the heart of life itself. The just shall live by faith. A true Christian lives by faith in the Son of God who loved us and who gave himself for us, Paul says in Galatians 2. And so all the lines of the order of salvation, justification, repentance, sanctification, holiness, love, good works, they all are connected with faith. You can't exercise any of these things without faith in Christ. J.C. Ryle so eloquently expresses the centrality of faith in Christ for salvation when he says this, saving faith is the hand of the soul. The sinner is like a drowning man at the point of sinking. And by grace, he reaches out and lays hold of Christ and is saved. Saving faith is the eye of the soul. The sinner is like the Israelite bitten by the fiery serpent in the wilderness at the point of death. The Lord Jesus Christ is lifted up, offered to him as the brazen serpent. He looks and is healed. Saving faith is the mouth of the soul. The sinner is starving for lack of food, sick of sore disease. The Lord Jesus is set before him as the bread of life, the universal medicine. He receives it, is made well and strong. Saving faith is the foot of the soul. The sinner is pursued by a deadly enemy. He flees to Jesus Christ as his strong tower, his hiding place, his refuge. He runs into it and is safe. And behind all four of these things, Ryle says, this is faith, the hand of the soul, the eye of the soul, the mouth of the soul, the foot of the soul. Faith is central to everything. And that's why you can't come to the Lord's Supper without the seed of saving faith within you. Because it's by faith in Christ that we are saved. And the Lord's Supper is not an ordinance to save people. It's an ordinance designed to strengthen the faith of those who already are saved, or those who already, you might say it this way, have faith. The goal of the Lord's Supper is to strengthen our weak, needy souls in their faith. And so this morning, we want to look at this whole subject of faith, what it is and how we receive it and how we exercise it and how it can grow in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll do that from Mark 9, verse 24, and Lord's Day 7, of our Heidelberg Catechism. Mark 9, 24, straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. And Lord's Day 7, questions 20 through 23. Are all men then as they perish in Adam saved by Christ? <coughs> no. Only those who are engrafted into him and receive all his benefits by a true faith. What is true faith? True faith is not only a certain knowledge whereby I hold for truth all that God has revealed to us in his word, but also an assured confidence which the Holy Ghost works by the gospel in my heart, that not only to others but to me also, remission of sin, everlasting righteousness and salvation, are freely given by God, merely of grace, only for the sake of Christ's 
merits. What is then necessary for a Christian to believe? All things promised us in the gospel, which the articles of our Catholic undoubted Christian faith briefly teach us. And what are these articles? And then follows the Apostles' Creed, which is the substance then of Lord's Days 8 through 22. So we'll be having 15 sermons on the grand truths of the Bible revealed to us in the Apostles' Creed. So our theme then this morning is true faith in Christ. I want to look at five thoughts with you. First, why is it necessary? Second, what is it not? I want to distinguish true faith from false. Third, what is it? We'll spend half of our time there. Fourth, how does it differ from assurance? And fifth, what is its content? So five questions to try to lay hold of this doctrine, true faith in Christ. First, then, we want to look at its necessity. True faith is absolutely necessary for two reasons. The first is for the salvation of the lost. You cannot be saved without true faith. True faith is a holy command. It's a pressing necessity, and it's a pressing urgency. John Flavel said, the soul is the life of the body, but faith is the life of the soul, and Christ is the life of faith. The soul is the life of the body, faith is the life of the soul, but Christ is the life of faith. So faith is not an option to enhance your spiritual life, but it's a necessity for salvation, for spiritual life, for communion with God, for fruitfulness in our daily walk, for deliverance from hell, for eternal glory, for genuine happiness. Faith is central to this life and the life to come. It's indispensable. Mark 16 says, without faith there is only damnation. John 3, 18 says, he that believes on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. John 3, 36 says, he that believeth on the Son has everlasting life. He that believes not on the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. You see, it's not just that faith is necessary, but faith in Christ is necessary. Strictly speaking, it's not faith that saves us, but Christ who saves us. But he does it through faith. Faith is the means by which we receive him. Like a straw is the means by which we receive water in the glass as we drink the water. Faith is a straw. It's the connecting link. It's, it's how you receive the Lord Jesus Christ. John writes it this way. Faith must unite us to God's Son, for he alone is the mediator of eternal life. John 14. And again, in 1 John 5, John writes, this is the record that God has given to us eternal life. This life is in his Son. He that has the Son hath life. He that is not the Son has not life. These things have I written to you that you may believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. And so it's impossible to be saved without saving faith in Jesus Christ through the Word of God, the Bible. That's why missionary 
work around the world is so urgent because if people don't hear the Word of God, don't hear Jesus Christ preach as the only Savior, they can't have faith in Him of whom they have not heard. Romans 10. That's why the Westminster Larger Catechism says, Can they who have never heard the gospel and so do not know Jesus Christ nor believe in Him be saved by their living according to the light of nature? That is, by living as good as you can outwardly without having saving faith? Answer, they who, having never heard the gospel, know not Jesus Christ, believe not in him, cannot be saved. Be they never so diligent to frame their lives according to the light of nature or the laws of that religion which they profess. For there is salvation in no other but in Christ alone, who is the Savior only of his body, the church. And so we need to ask ourselves this morning, the basic question of all questions Am I, by God's grace, a possessor of true saving faith? If I'm not, I'm on my way. You understand that? I'm on my way to hell right now. I could die today and forever be lost. You must be born again. You must be a possessor of true saving faith in Christ alone for salvation, or you will perish. There are 300 texts in the Bible that speak of the necessity of saving faith in Jesus Christ. But secondly, we need faith not only to get saved, but to grow, to grow in our salvation. The disciples came to Jesus and said, Lord, increase our faith because they wanted to grow. Now, it's true, Jesus extolled faith when it's as tiny as a mustard seed in Luke 17. He said it can, it can remove mountains. It's powerful, even the smallest amount of faith. But he also rebuked his disciples, didn't he, for having little faith. Smallness of faith often leads to anxiety in daily needs, in, in spiritual needs, It leads to uh, doubts about the power of God, weakness in understanding God's word. God wants his people to grow. And he does that by having them grow in faith. That's why Jesus commended the centurion and the Canaanized woman for their great faith, their mature faith. That's why Paul compliments the Thessalonians. He says to the... uh, You in Thessalonica, I thank God for you because your faith groweth exceedingly. 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 3. And that's why certain notable Christians like Stephen and Barnabas in Acts 6 and Acts 11 are spoken of as having great faith being, the exact expression, full of faith. You see, when believers grow in their faith, it not only blesses them, but it expands the missionary growth of the kingdom of God, and they become a blessing to those around them in the church and beyond the church. And that's a tremendous blessing. And that's the purpose of the Lord's Supper, that we grow in faith, that our faith is strengthened, not just so we have a God and me thing, that my relationship with him is growing and that's the end of the story, that's, of course, very important. But the relationship between God and me, the vertical relationship, has horizontal ramifications. When I grow in faith, out of the abundance of my heart, my mouth will speak. I cannot but speak of the things of God and my life will then be more contagious to others. And so growth in faith is necessary for my own personal growth, but also for the spreading of the kingdom of God around the world. And that's why Paul says this, as you therefore have received the Lord Jesus Christ by faith, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith as ye have been taught 
abounding therein with thanksgiving. And so what happens is when we grow in faith, we more and more become Christ-centered. We more and more see that Jesus meets all our needs as prophet, as priest, and as king. And we use the means of grace with diligence, studying the word, praying for the grace of the Spirit, clinging to Christ also when sorrows come, growing in faith by fellowshipping with Christ every day, living by faith in the Son of God. That is what gives growth to a Christian. Now that raises the question then, if faith is so absolutely necessary, what is it? And to understand what it is, we need, first of all, to look at its biblical terminology. The original words can shed a lot of light on the nature of a thing, and that's true of faith as well. In the Old Testament, the word for faith is the word aman. That's the main word, at least. There's several words that are translated faith, but that's the main word. And aman means to make firm, to establish to be reliable, something you can lean on, and it won't give way. You know, there was a missionary to the New Hebrides, John Payton, who, who couldn't find a, a word for faith in the native language. And one day he's walking along, and there's two natives in front of him, and there's a very narrow bridge that goes over a ravine. It's kind of a shaky bridge, and one native just walks straight across it, no problem. The next native hesitates. He starts to go on the first step, and he's kind of shaky, and the first native shouts back to him, lean on the bridge. If you just lean your weight on it, and you go straight across it, it will bring you safely across. But Peyton heard that word, lean on. That's the word he used in their language for faith. It's reliable. You lean on it. It will hold you up. It's, it's like a solid rock on which you can build your hope in your life. And from this word, of course, we get the word amen or amen, which means it shall certainly be. It's firm. There's a faithfulness that lies behind what is believed. It's the opposite of deception. It won't let you down. God is a God of faithfulness. The Bible says again and again in the Psalms, also in Proverbs 12. And you see, to hear him and to believe him and to put your trust in him is to put your trust in a rock. It's solid. Faith in God and God alone will never, ever perish. Now, the other Old Testament word translated for faith is bata, and that means to trust, simply to trust. There's a close interrelationship, you see, between faith, believing, and trusting. You, you trust when you believe, you believe when you trust. O Israel, Psalm 115, verse 9, trust thou in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. You see the connection between believing and trusting. Now, in the New Testament, the word is pistuo, which means literally to believe, but a believing that puts all your trust in something, it actually means a surrendering trust. You, you don't trust anymore in anything else, not even in yourself. In fact, all your righteousness becomes unrighteousness. And so when you believe, pistero in the New Testament, and by the way, that word is used 248 times as a verb, and 244 times as a noun, and 67 times as an adjective. So over 500 times in the New Testament alone. That's how prominent the idea of faith is. But this word in particular shows us that faith is not just some little easy believism type thing where you stand up in a meeting and you, and you, and you raise your hand or you come forward on, on an impulse. No, faith 
is something where you count the cost and you surrender the totality of your being, soul and body, to trust another rather than yourself. It's like giving the keys of your car over to someone else to drive. You become the passenger. God becomes the driver, the pilot, the helmsman. You surrender to God and to his way of salvation. That's what the word faith means. And in the New Testament, a certain phrase is used, pistuo eis, which means to believe into, to believe into Christ. It means you don't just surrender before him, you don't just take refuge to him, but you take refuge in him. You see, faith unites. That's what Lord's Day 7 says in question 20. Are all men then as they perish in Adam saved by Christ? No, only those who are ingrafted into him. The way something is grafted into something else. That's what faith does. Faith is a gift of the Holy Spirit. And in, in, in the exercise of faith, when a sinner believes in Christ alone for salvation, that sinner is engrafted into Jesus so that he becomes my identity, he becomes my object of faith, he becomes my all and in all, he becomes number one in my life. He's adorable, he's worshipful, he's treasured, he's my love, he's my life, he's my salvation, he's my kinsman, he's my rock. Paul says he's my all and in all. That's what faith means. Surrender to God's gospel way of salvation, which is Jesus Christ and him crucified, and Jesus Christ, and him exalted. Now, there are forms of false faith, you see. When we explain what faith is, we must always explain what faith is not as well. And our forefathers had, had labels for them. Let me just give them to you very briefly. First, saving faith is not mere mental belief not mere mental belief. That's what our forefathers called historical faith. That's when you believe the Bible is true with your mind, but you don't have it impact your heart and your life and the totality of your being, and you don't surrender to it, so it doesn't really fundamentally change your life. You can, you can come to church all your life with historical faith. You can argue with people at work on the basis of what you believe about the Bible, but not have it be at the center of your inmost soul. There was a man named Robert Sandeman, Sandeman, in the 18th century, who was the father of what came to be known as Sandemanianism. And Robert Sandeman taught this, that if you just believe that the Bible is the Word of God, from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, with your mind only, you are saved. You are saved. Today, most people don't realize it, but there are millions of Sandemanians running around our country. They say, yeah, I believe the Bible. Oh, you meet people on planes and say, I believe the Bible. I, but, you know, I don't go to church, or, or I do go to church, but... Uh, but it, it doesn't impact my life. It's not the center of my life. I am the center of my life, not Jesus Christ. I live for me, not for him. I want to go to heaven, so I believe the Bible. And I believe the basics of salvation. I believe the Apostles' Creed. But I believe it only in my mind. That is true of millions and millions of people, and perhaps many sitting here this morning. But you see, if that's true faith, then you would be saved and you'd be justified, and yet you could remain as wicked as the devil. Because the devils believe, James 2 verse 19, the devils believe that Genesis 1 to Revelation 22 is the Bible. And they even tremble. Jonathan Edwards has a whole sermon on that and says, you know, the devils have more historical faith than some people who have only historical faith because they believe and don't tremble, and the devils believe and tremble. But the devils are not saved. Our day of rampant 
humanism, secularism, atheism, all kinds of isms, where people don't believe the Bible, brings us into the temptation that when someone changes their views and they say, wow, I, I, I now believe the Bible, right away people say, oh, you must be saved then, because so many people don't believe the Bible. But you see, you can believe the Bible with your head and not believe it in your heart. That's, that's, that's what Herod Agrippa had. Herod Agrippa had historical faith. Paul said to him, Believest thou the prophets, Herod? I know that thou believest. I know that thou believest. And yet Agrippa was no Christian. Acts 26, 27, and 28. He said, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Agrippa said, hey, Yeah, I believe the Bible. I believe the prophets, but I, I'm not well, willing to surrender my life to the truth that those prophets brought. That's historical faith. So you can agree with the outward truth and yet have no work of grace, saving faith in your soul. Secondly, saving faith is not transient emotional commitment, temporary faith, as our forefathers called it. It's possible, Jesus said, to receive the word with joy for a while, but later fall away. Luke 8, verse 13. Israel believed God's word and sang his praises by the Red Sea. But Psalm 106 says they soon forget his works and believe not his word. You see, it's possible to be a Demas or possible to... to to have this temporary joy. Some people, it's like infatuation. When, when you first begin, someone first begins to court or date another person and they really like them a lot and then the infatuation wears away and it just fades away. The relationship doesn't last. That's what temporary faith is like. Now, there are people of God, of course, real people of God who struggle with this, also in preparatory week. Do I just have temporary faith? And actually, if you take four simple marks, you can really know whether you have temporary faith or saving faith. Let me give them to you. Number one, temporary faith is temporary. That's why it gets its name. Saving faith is abiding. Now, it gets its name from this that it can last maybe six months. In rare cases, it can last a whole year. Very rare cases, I suppose, it can even last a bit longer than that. But temporary faith is basically historical faith with some emotion and some joy and see some, something of the beauty of, of the truth of the Bible. But it still doesn't make me surrender. And so it fades away. It doesn't unite me with Jesus Christ. Christ does not become my all and in all in temporary faith. My conversion may become my all and in all, and my story may become my all or my in all. But there are too many children of God, genuine children of God, who've been walking with the Lord for years, who are still worried they have temporary faith. Well, you, you, you just don't have temporary faith for years and years. The example Jesus gave is the plant grows up in a night, and the sun comes out, and, and persecution strikes it through the sun, and it withers because there's no roots. It's something short. Number two. Temporary faith folds up under persecution, like the sun shining upon it, has no roots, it dies. Saving faith is strengthened under persecution because it flies to Jesus as its strength. Three, temporary faith is known for its rapid growth. Oh, people become believers in a day. They've got assurance of faith. In the first day, they're going out evangelizing other people. That's usually the nature of temporary faith, full of activity, full of joy, and then it fades away. Saving faith usually grows more gradually because the roots go down deeper, and then the fruit goes up more gradually. Now, there's exceptions to that. There can be a lot of excitement in the beginning of saving faith as well, but it abides. There's growth going on, a deepening in the roots and more fruit to come. And then fourth, deep down, temporary faith always ends in self. 
It's my religion, my exercises, my emotions, my tears, my prayers. Saving faith drives a sinner outside of himself to Jesus Christ. That's the difference. And then there's a third kind of false faith, which is a confidence in miracles, or as our forefathers called it, miraculous faith. That's people that believe that God is going to do a miracle on me or by me or believes in miracles to others, but they don't truly believe where their own soul unto salvation, that Jesus Christ alone must be their entire salvation. Now, it's possible to have saving faith and believe in a God of miracles at the same time, but it's possible, you see, to have this faith of miracles and not have saving faith. Like Judas Iscariot, he was commissioned to work miracles in Matthew 10, but he was a wicked man. He didn't have saving faith. And Jesus said he would reject many miracle workers on the judgment day. He said, some will come in front of me and say, but I cast out demons in your name. And he will say, I never knew you. You see, it's not enough to have faith in a God of providence, to have faith in a God of miracles, to have faith in a God who's written the Bible. You've got to have a personal faith in Jesus Christ that he alone is the Savior of your soul. You need him. Now, that leads us then to the definition of true saving faith. What is it? What is it? Well, saving faith is something that impacts the whole man. It's a disposition, emotion of the soul, the mind, the will. It's not something just physical, but it's something that involves the whole person. We might define saving faith this way. Saving faith is trusting in the Lord alone for his salvation. By, I have three things here, knowing God experientially. John 17, 3, this is life eternal to know God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. Second, assenting to his word submissively. And third, relying upon him or trusting in Christ dependently. The saving faith is trusting in the Lord alone for his salvation by knowing him experientially, assenting to his word submissively, and relying upon Christ dependently as the only mediator. So there's three aspects to faith, and you catch that also in question 21. True faith is not only certain knowledge, there's the knowledge, whereby I hold for truth, all that God has revealed to us in his word, I hold it, so I agree with it, there's the assent, but also an assured confidence, or sometimes called trust, an assured trust. So you've got knowledge, assent, and trust. Those are the three elements of faith. And those three elements, you notice, cover the whole man. What, 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 does you, what do you consist of, really, inside of you? You have an intellectual element, knowledge. You have emotional or an element of affections, assent from the heart. And you have a will. That's called the volitional element. Your will, wills to receive the Lord Jesus Christ by the gift of the Holy Spirit. All three are involved. Sometimes in church history, even some of our sound forefathers, when you read their chapters on faith, some emphasize knowing, some emphasize the assent, and, and most emphasize the will. But really, all three need to be emphasized, and all three have a saving dimension about them. It's not so, as some of our forefathers said, that you have a historical knowledge and a historical assent, and then trust is your saving element. So f saving faith is only trust. No, it's a saving knowledge, a saving assent, and a saving trust. Let me give you this example. If two men sat down and had a piece of pizza, and one man just could look at it. He's got stomach cancer. He can't eat it. But he's a nutritionist. He might have quite a bit of knowledge about what's in the pizza. He, maybe he could write a five-page paper about the pizza. 
The other man just knows there's cheese and pepperoni. Maybe he doesn't know so much. He knows something, of course. But he tastes the pizza. Who, who knows the pizza? Well, the man with lesser head knowledge actually knows the pizza better than the man who can't taste it. And you see, in the Bible, again and again, when it speaks about knowing God, it speaks about knowing him in this intimate tasting way. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good, the psalmist says. Jeremiah says, thy word was sweeter than honey, and I did eat it, and it was sweet to my taste. Again and again, you see in the Bible, saving faith is described in terms of the senses, in terms of a personal knowing, a saving knowing, in the very word to know. The very word to know, both in Hebrew and in Greek, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, is an intimate term. It's not just a head knowledge thing. That's the problem in English. We, we have a very limited vocabulary with the word to know. You say, I know this is a pulpit. I know God. I know my wife. We use the same word for everything. But in Hebrew and Greek, when the word to know is used in relationships, it's an intimate thing. Adam knew his wife Eve and they conceived. It's actually used as, as, as a word describing the intimacy of the sexual relation in marriage. And John 17, 3, I quoted already, which by the way is the most popular text in our church history that the Reformers and Puritans preached on. Did you know that? The most common text they preached on. This is life eternal to know God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. That's life eternal. But that's, again, an intimate knowing. So you have in faith this intimate knowledge that goes beyond the historical faith. It's an experiential knowledge so that I have an inward sense of God and of Jesus and of what God has done in Jesus to save my soul. And when you have an experimental knowledge of God, a saving knowledge of God, there will also be a humbling knowledge of yourself. You see this again and again in the Bible, whether you go to Isaiah and he sees the vision of God, when he gets to know God, what does he say? Oh, woe is me, wretched man I am. I'm a man of unclean lips. Or the psalmist, Psalm 130, if thou, Lord, should some mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? Psalm 143, enter not into judgment with thy servant, for in thy sight shall no man living be justified. So you want to know if you have the root of saving faith and a right, therefore, to come to the Lord's Supper? Just ask yourself this question. Do I know what it means in my life to have all my hope go outside of myself to Jesus? Do I know him even, even a little bit it's my only hope and my only salvation. And do I correspondingly know necessarily that there's nothing in me that can ever save me and that my knowledge of Jesus humbles me, that he would be mindful of me because in my flesh dwells no good thing. I'm full of sin and guilt by myself. But my hope is in Jesus. So a sense of my own misery, my own sinfulness, my own need, goes parallel with a sense of finding my needs met in the Lord Jesus Christ and knowing him. And then secondly, I don't only know God experientially to some degree through his word, by his spirit, it's all a gift of God, but I also assent, I assent, I agree, that means, with God's word, submissively. I agree that I am nothing from the heart, not just my mind. I agree from the heart. It's a saving ascent that I am nothing but sin in myself, a bundle of sin in my flesh dwells no good thing. I agree with that. I've experienced that. I'm a lost sinner apart from the grace of God in Jesus Christ. At the same time, I assent I agree that Jesus Christ is the Lord our righteousness. He's my only hope and my only salvation, and in him alone do I trust. And even though I don't always have the full assurance of faith that I desire, I cannot deny that everything I hope in 
Why is it in Jesus? I assent to this. I assent to the word of God that there is no other name given among heaven among men whereby we must be saved than the name of Jesus Christ. Philip Melanchthon, Martin Luther's right-hand man, said this, Faith is a constant agreement to God's every word. But that faith does not exist outside of God's Spirit renewing and enlightening our hearts so that we submit to that word. So what happens, you see? In true saving faith, which is the gift of God, the Spirit works in us not only a knowledge to know God in the face of Jesus Christ, but we also say amen to it. As painful as it is on our side of the ledger, because we're only sinners, we, we bow under it, we agree with it wholeheartedly. I'm nothing but a sinner. Like the Canaanitish woman. I'm, truth Lord, I'm a dog. I agree, I agree. I'm, I, you could call me a bad enough name. I'm just a, a beast before thee, said Asaph. But oh, my hope is in thee. Lord, help me. Lord, help me. And she casts herself upon him. You see, you agree. You agree with who God is, and you agree with who you are, and then you want to live according to what you agree with. That's why Paul speaks of the obedience of faith. Faith wants to obey. Faith wants to say amen to it not only, but live it out. Live it out. So in true faith, there is this assent that brings submission. Submission of the mind, submission of the will, submission of the heart. We want to bow under God. And even when we don't bow under God, it bothers us. It makes us feel guilty, you see. We wish, we wish that with the totality of our being, we could be totally submissive to God all the time. But you can't deny when you have true faith that you do know what it means to bow under God and to be submissive to Him and to His Word so that His Word guide your life, is a compass to your life, and not you yourself and your fleeting desires. And then thirdly, you rely on Christ dependently. You trust him. You trust him. You trust his promises. You see, in the Bible, trusting in Christ, the gospel, the promises, these, these, they're, they're all yea and amen in Jesus. The promises, the gospel, and Christ are almost like synonyms. They, they say the same thing. The object of your faith is the promises, right? Well, yes, but the object of your faith is the gospel, right? Well, yes, but the object of your faith is Jesus Christ, right? Yes, but there's no contradiction between those. They're the same. Who is Jesus Christ? He's the promises of God that are yea and amen in the gospel. And so faith trusts completely in the gospel. It falls into the arms of the evangel, the gospel. It's like a man who's falling from a building, and he falls into a trampoline, and he's safe. Faith takes the leap, and it falls into the arms of the gospel. If I perish, I perish, but faith takes the leap, trusting God. And you can summarize this in two expressions. Let me just give them to you briefly. The first is this. Faith, when it trusts God, when it has trust, reliance, confidence, by the way, are the three words our forefathers used. They're all biblical words. They're repeated throughout the scriptures. They're all this third element. You trust, you rely, you have confidence in. Now, the first thing that that means is you receive by faith the whole Christ, the whole Christ, prophet, priest, king, to teach you, to intercede for you, to sacrifice for you, to guide you, to rule you. Faith does not ever say, well, I'm going to receive Jesus as Savior, but I don't want, to, I don't want him to be Lord over me. No. Faith receives the whole Christ. That's an important part of faith because I'm a complete sinner who needs a complete Savior. And so what faith does is it empties me of all my own righteousness and it fills me with the righteousness of Christ. So I become nothing 
and he becomes everything. And then second, this element of trust is something more. I don't only receive the whole Christ, but I rest. I rest upon Christ alone. I rest my case upon him. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Isaiah 28, verse 6, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. That's, of course, Jesus. He that believeth shall not make haste. That is, in the original Hebrew, shall flee in panic. You don't panic. You don't run away from him. You rest upon him. Come unto me. All ye that are weary and heavy laden. And you shall find rest. We rest upon Christ alone for salvation when we trust him, which the flip side of that is that means we distrust everything outside of Christ. We don't trust our own righteousness. We don't trust our own prayers, our own exercises. We trust Christ alone. Everything else is excluded. There is no other name given among men under heaven, whereby we must be saved. So this is faith. Faith comes. Faith believes. Faith receives. Faith rests in Jesus Christ. It empties me of who I am, and it fills me with Jesus Christ. So I renounce self precisely because I'm embracing Christ, and I consciously say, He's the one, not me, who can save me. I surrender. I fall into the outstretched arms of God. I cry out by faith. Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress. Helpless look to thee for grace. Foul, I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, else I die. But then... Faith also lives out of that Christ. I don't only get saved by him, but I remain saved in him. And I trust in him for my entire life. I abide in him. I'm not only engrafted into him, I abide in him. And I I get the juices, the sap of him through his word, coming to me, preached, read, through the means of grace, reading good books, fellowshipping, prayer, I keep getting the sap of Jesus. I keep abiding in him. I keep wanting to obey him. I keep wanting to grow in him. I keep wanting to live out of him. That's what faith does. That's what faith is. So what's the summary of everything I've said in this sermon? I can put it in one sentence for you. Faith commits the total person of the sinner to the total person of Christ the Savior. And it's by that faith that I then strive against all the obstacles that come my way and that I learn to say with the father of the demoniac, Lord, I believe. Help thou with tears my unbelief. Lord, I believe. The father of the demoniac cries out, help thou my unbelief. This man came talking about his boy, didn't he? He wanted Jesus to help his son. And he says to Jesus, if you can do anything, please help, please help, please deliver. And Jesus says, if thou canst believe, if thou canst have faith, all things are possible to him that believeth. You see how Jesus turns the table on this man. And he does it all the time, doesn't he? You you see it all the time in the Gospels when a parent brings a child to Jesus. The parent is concerned about the child. And Jesus says, wait a minute, wait a minute. We're going to first deal with your soul. Same thing with the Canaanitish woman I just mentioned earlier. Her first prayer, oh, Lord, have mercy upon me, son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. It's all about her daughter. And when Jesus is done dealing with their souls, she's saying, Lord, help me, help me. You see, faith is a personal thing. You've got to know it. Nobody else can do it. Nobody else can come to the Lord's Supper for you or be prepared for you. It's got to go on in your soul. 
Lord, help me. It's got to come to that point where you can't help yourself. And you just fall into the arms of God as your only helper, as your only Savior, as your only Lord, as the altogether lovely one, as a poor, needy sinner, like this man did here. Lord, I believe. He says it with tears. He's melted down before the Lord. He trusts in Jesus, not just in miraculous faith, but as his only Savior. It's a personal thing now. I believe. How do you know it wasn't just miraculous faith? How do you know it wasn't just something on the surface? Well, he cries out, help my unbelief. You see, that's the struggle of every believer. Every true believer knows this cry. Lifelong. It's not just the cry of a beginner in grace, as a lot of people say. It is that. But it's a cry that God's people experience their whole life. Oh, my wretched unbelief. I want to have more faith. I want to have full assurance of faith. Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. There's a tug of war going on inside this man, you see. A tug of war, the the Roman 7 war going on inside of a child of God. All the time. I want to believe. I want to live Christ-centered. But I'm still so self-centered. I'm still, oh, and my flesh dwells no good thing. Oh, God, the good I would, I do not. The evil that I would not, I find myself doing. Wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, there's this tug of war. The old nature is pulling on one end of the rope. The new nature is pulling on the other end of the rope. And there's this battle. Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. And so we come to the Lord's Supper, not saying we're done with unbelief, not saying that we need to have full assurance of faith to come to the Lord's Supper. That's a mistake that many people make. Also, some people in our midst, I'm afraid. No, if the Lord's Supper is just for those who have full assurance of faith, there won't be very many people there, I assure you that. And not only that, but the whole purpose of the Lord's Supper is to strengthen faith for the weak. In a way, it's especially for the weak in faith. That's why the Heidelberg Catechism says, he commands me and all believers to partake. It doesn't say the strong in faith. So those who can cry out, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief, they're welcome. Ah, yes, you say, but how do I know? How do I know if I'm one of those? Well, let me just give you a few marks of grace from from this man's life, and you examine yourself. Number one, faith makes our hearts tender and broken. This man was melted down before Christ. Has, Has Has your faith, has God's Spirit ever broken you on account of your sin and made you tender? Have you ever cried out, Lord, I cannot not believe, and and yet, oh, I'm so unbelieving. Oh, Lord, help me. Have you become soft before your Savior like this man did? Has your heart melted down before him? Have you laid your weapons down, surrendered? If that's never happened to you, 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 and you've never lost the battle, and, and... Christ has never become your only hope, there's there's no room on the Lord's Supper because you do this in remembrance of him, not of you. And if you don't know him at all, you'll get nothing out of it. Number two, if you have true faith, you have a deep awareness of your remaining unbelief. Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. Do you hate your unbelief? Do you wage war against your unbelief? See, if you're a true believer, you know what holy war means. And you know the grief of heart when you stumble, sometimes over small temptations, and you can't believe you're so weak and so unbelieving. And you cry out, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. And third, if you have true faith, you're always hungering and thirsting for more faith. Lord, increase our faith, the disciples said. If you don't want your faith increased, you're not a child of God. It's that plain and simple. God's people cannot deny that they have true faith, but oh, oh, if only I could believe more. Lord, increase my faith. And then fourth, if you have true faith, you come to Christ with prayers and cries like this man. 
you, you can't stay away from him. You can't live without Jesus. Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. I need thee, Lord. I'm weak. I'm sinful. I'm foolish. I need thee every day. I need thee every hour. Come and help me. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Is this your life? Is this your cry? You understand the struggle? For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. Galatians 5. Yes, the question isn't, I can only come if I have full assurance of faith. The question is, do you have faith, saving faith, to some degree? And is that faith in Christ? Even if it's as small as a grain of a mustard seed, you belong at the table of the Lord, looking to Jesus, praying, strengthen, strengthen my weak faith, O Lord. Now, assurance of faith, Assurance of faith is something that involves three things. Our forefathers are very clear on this. The Bible's very clear on this. The way to get assurance of faith is to trust in the promises of the gospel alone. That's your objective ground, your primary ground of assurance of faith. All the promises of God in him are yea and in him amen unto the glory of God by us. 2 Corinthians 1.20. Your, your assurance is never primarily grounded on anything in you. It's got to be outside of you. And the only one who is sure in Jesus Christ. But that assurance needs to be corroborated within you so that you know that the Christ outside of you is also the Christ in you by his Spirit who by faith has connected you to him. Because there are millions of people that say they believe the promises, that all the promises of the Bible are for them, but their lives don't show it. So the second ground of assurance is what our forefathers called the inward evidences or the fruits, the fruits of saving grace. The Bible puts it this way, 1 John 2, 3, hereby we do know that we know him. And then it gives you many different Grounds. There's nine different marks of grace in 1 John. 1 John is the book of assurance of faith in the Bible. This particular text says, if we keep his commandments. So do you really love God's law? Do you really long to keep his commandments? Well, that's an evidence that God is working in you. So there are evidences that when you prayerfully consider them, you cannot deny. You can't deny you hunger and thirst after righteousness. You can't deny the fruits of the Spirit in you. And therefore, you conclude, I must be a child of God. And the Spirit witnesses with your spirit that this is true. You're not just making these things up. This is your experience. And then thirdly, there is what's called the testimony of the Holy Spirit, the direct testimony of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit, from the Word of God, applies that Word with power to your soul, that your sins are forgiven, or some other promise, and you, it becomes real for you, and it bears the fruit of humility afterward, that it humbles you to the dust, that too can give a good boost to your assurance. Full assurance of faith is when you have as much as possible of all three of these. You're trusting in the promises, your life is manifesting fruits, and the Spirit is testifying with your spirit You're a child of God directly through the word of God. Now, what is it then that you truly believe? All we've talked a lot about faith, but what do we truly believe? Well, our forefathers then say we believe, especially the summary of the apostolic faith formed in the Apostles' Creed. And we'll be looking at that in 15 Lord's Days. But let me just say simply this, that this is a wonderful summary that gives you all that you need in the basics, the very basics of the faith to experience not only knowing it in your head, assenting to it with your heart, but also trusting these truths and relying upon them for your salvation. Well, I hope that this explanation this morning is helpful 
And I hope you'll be able to say with more certainty, those of you who are struggling with doubts, that yes, I cannot deny that I have true faith. Or, if you're not a true believer, that you may realize what you're missing, and that it may drive you outside of yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Gracious God, we ask thy blessing upon this sermon, and we pray that thou wilt use it to shed light in the hearts of thy people, but also to arrest the unsaved, and that we might be people of faith, even though our faith may be weak and small, we pray, Lord, that thou wilt use the Lord's Supper to grow it, to strengthen our faith, so that we may rest in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ and find in him our all and in all for salvation. So bless us now and further throughout this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.